Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good? Who likes going after sacred cows? Okay, we're going after a sacred cow today, okay? Um, to do that, though, I'm going to need all of your engagement. We're going to have some polling questions. Can, and one other thing, can everybody read? Okay, good, because I'm going to ask you to read some slides. Instead of me reading to you, we're going to ask you to read some quotes from the book. You know, this book is um, really laying out a long-term vision for the direction the technology industry and industrial companies and medical device companies need to go to be able to continue to profitably grow and deliver value to customers. And that long-term strategy is a very different view of the world than the way most companies operate today. But we're going to go deeper into the book and focus now on two chapters that really should be taken together. The chapter on what we call data-driven sales and the chapter on customer success at scale. Okay? So let me start by asking you a couple of questions. You got your, your phones ready to go here? And we're going to use this data, by the way, for research purposes, right? So please, please give us your honest answer. Um, and you in the virtual audience, please weigh in. OK, here's the first question. Do you think that the percentage of total revenue that your company spends on sales and marketing is too high, about right, or not enough? OK, let's go. Too high, about right, not enough. Too high, not right, not right, about right, not. OK, so we have a lot of too highs. Very interesting, very interesting. We have a lot of too highs and a lot of not enoughs. Very interesting, very interesting. OK, so the majority of you, the, the number one answer is too high, OK? All right. So. Let's take that poll down. Now I have a second question for you. Do you think the percentage of total revenue that your company is spending on customer success is too high, about right, or not enough? What do you mean a loaded question? Come on. OK, I can pretty much take take the poll down, right? It's pretty clear, pretty clear. Most all of us believe we're not spending enough money on customer success. Third question, do you think the percentage of total revenue you're spending on other services, support services, professional services, education services, is too high, about right, or not enough? Now, this is not surprising either, right? Everybody wants a bigger budget, yeah? OK, so 60% say not enough. All right, I need to give you a definition for today. Total customer engagement costs. Sales and marketing costs plus customer success costs plus customer service costs. Total customer engagement cost, or TKEC. All right? Now, one final poll. Do you predict that unit prices for your technology over the long term are going to go up, stay the same, or go down? The prices over the long term for your products, your offers, are they going to go up? stay the same, or go down? Go up, stay the same, or go down? So we have almost an even split. Go up, 
versus go down or stay the same. I would tell you, those of you who think it's going to go up, history is not on your side. History is not on your side. I think, TSIA thinks, the cost of marketing is too low, right? Marketing, marketing has another job now. They have to drive adoption. They have to market features of products to end users that aren't using. They have to market the next expansion. They have to be much more integrated into the overall customer life cycle, and it's going to cost them money to go do that. We need marketing's involvement, not just in land, but in land, adopt, expand, and renew. So we think marketing needs more money. We think the cost of sales is too high. And the sacred cow that we're going to go after today is the sales budget. We're going after the sales budget. Now, we're not going after the sales people. I love the, we love the sales people. We're going after their model. We're going after their model. We need less labor in that model. We got to take human resource investment out of the sales model. Customer success, for sure, for sure, needs investment to become customer success at scale. And we're going to talk about what that means a little bit later today. But there is absolutely no doubt that we need to grow the capabilities and invest more in the customer success function to successfully and reliably drive adoption, expansion, and renewal. We got to bring it to full scale. Lastly, the cost of other services is still too high. I know you say you want more budget, but I would submit to you that if you're in professional services or you're in support or even if you're in education, you're dealt a hand by the product business units. That hand is the application or that hand is the device or whatever it is. You're given a hand to play. It can be a winning hand, mean, meaning the products are reliable, they're easy to implement, they're easy to use, right? It can be a winning hand, a hand that you don't need to put a lot of labor into in order to generate customer success. Or you could be dealt a crappy hand. You could be given an unreliable product, a product that's hard to integrate, a product that is hard to implement a product that requires a lot of training. And if you're dealt that hand, you are going to need more budget. But funding, funding bad products to protect the customer experience is no bueno. It is no bueno. Marketing needs to go up. Customer success needs to go up. Sales budgets need to go down. Service budgets need to go down. Service budgets can't go down unless the product teams deal services a great hand. And that, that engineering out the service requirement is the mandate that our product teams need to go after. So what if we only do the increased budgets? What if we only give marketing more money, and we only give customer success more money, your company is going to run out of money. I'm serious. You're going to run out of money. And historically, as we have watched you know, the evolution of our industry in B for B terms, right? the evolution of our industry from sort of make, sell, and ship product business models, right? 
thinking like manufacturers, can make products, sell products, ship products, give them to the customer, customer owns them, customer gets value out of them. You know, that was a level one provider, right? And we said, geez, a decade ago, hey, we're on this journey, right? We're on this journey to help not just build and sell products, but to help optimize the value that customers are getting from those products, right? And ultimately, to be able to reliably sell and deliver business outcomes, not product SKUs, but business outcomes to our customers. How many times have you heard the word outcomes in the last three days, right? Everybody's talking about it. I mean, I can tell you there are people on our board, our executive board, who five years ago said, that's BS. We are never going to be in a position where we can be accountable for the business outcomes that our customers are getting from our solution. That person is 100% the opposite right now, right? Like, that is the future. Customers don't care how we do it. And they don't want to pay us based on the number of units we install or the number of SKUs or the whatever it is. They want to pay us for the outcomes, right? But in general, in general, along this journey, unit prices for most technology categories have gone down. Not up, but down. And if they go down, and we say, hey, right now, with all the money we're spending across sales and marketing and services and success, we need to spend yet more, more on marketing, more on success, in an environment where unit prices don't go up, and they're only going to go up, by the way, if we're successful at attaching our pricing to the outcomes and not competitive pricing, skew by skew by skew by skew, right? But if we don't do that, and prices continue to go down, and we do what we all know we need to do, more money into marketing, more customer success, we are literally going to be in a situation where the TCAC, the total customer engagement cost, breaks the bank. Now, <clears throat> Has anybody noticed what's been happening in the stock market the last few months? Anybody? <clears throat> there was a, a quote that, uh, that uh, I think Thomas sent me yesterday from an article that was written by a, a very successful multi-company CEO founder. And he was writing to other CEOs of other venture and private equity backed tech companies. He said, if you haven't already found a path to profitability, you better do it right now because the money is going to dry up. Right? And where is that money going, by and large? It's going to fund sales and marketing activities. Right? Companies that have 50% cost of sales and marketing, 70% cost of sales and marketing, 90%, in some cases 150% sales and marketing because cash was free, cash was cheap, valuations were high, you could get it from everywhere, right? And so they were taking in more cash and they were spending it, you know, in advance of their revenue. And they were spending it on TCAC largely, right? But those days, at least, for the foreseeable future, are increasingly about to end. And for those of you who are in uh, you know, more traditional companies, right, B born 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, right, who are pivoting over to SaaS, pivoting over to these new kinds of business models, if TCAC goes up too much, we're literally going to hit a Y in the road, where we have to decide whether we want to service our customers correctly in order to deliver value and grow, but become unprofitable in the process. Or we say, we need to protect the profits, and we're going to cap TCAC, and customer experience is going to be the cost. And our renewals 
and our expansions and our adoption are not going to be what they could be. That can't happen. That can't happen. We have got to do things differently going forward and think differently about how we engage with customers than we have ever thought about before. And, and we got to fund it right there. We got to fund it right there. We have got to redistribute sales budget to other parts of the company systematically and reliably and consciously and strategically and aggressively over the next few years. Now, <clears throat> how many of you think your sales leaders would be happy about what I'm up here saying right now? Hey, I got one hand out there. Can I, can I get your phone number? So, what other options are there? Well, <clears throat> in the book, we talk about the need to simplify your products, simplify the journey to value, simplify your business processes, simplify your offers, right? Got to go do all that. The second thing you got to do is you got to invest in a digital customer experience. Think differently about moving your customers through a life cycle and doing it digitally rather than doing it with labor. And long term, those are definitely the two right things to go do, definitely. But there's things we need to be doing now. One of them, which we're gonna talk about, is to do more what we call analytics-driven resource placement. And the other thing we need to do is learn to build and trust our lifecycle capability. And what do I mean by life cycle capability? I mean trusting A, E, and R. That we have the right resources and the right capabilities to drive systematically, reliably, predictable results across the customer life cycle. Value for the customer, revenue for us. And do that in a very systematic way. We're on that journey. We just got to go faster. We have got to go faster. So on the one hand, you need to be doing these long-term things. On the other hand, those are five or 10-year journeys. Building a very successful digital customer engagement model, if you're selling multi-million dollar mission critical systems to corporate customers, that is different than selling books online, right? Now we're going to get there. But it's not going to happen overnight. Simplifying your companies, simplifying your offers, improving the quality of your products is going to happen, but it's not going to happen overnight. So what can we start doing now? We've got to fund customer success at scale. We've got to put more money into marketing. And we can't wait five or 10 years to go do this. So what do we need to start doing? Okay, get ready to read, okay? First thing I need you to read. You think you can get agreement on that, right? Anybody gonna disagree with that, right? We need sales, we need sales. But we need sales to do the things that only sales can do, the things that deliver high value to our shareholders. What are some of those things? Geez, getting in to existing and new customers and identifying new sources of budget and securing those things, doing business outcome-based discovery with the C-suite, understanding where they want to take their companies, right? now and in one year and in three years and five years, right? Gaining the trust of those senior executives, becoming partners with those senior executives, aligning the internal stakeholders in the company to make sure we can deliver the promise of value that we've given to our customers. Handle complex price and legal negotiations, 
through procurement. And only work on the RFPs that you're going to win. You know, I can't tell you how many times I hear sales managers berating cut, uh, reps because they're not active in an RFP. There's an RFP on the street and we're not in there, right? Like, like they should be in every RFP. That's BS. You should be in the RFPs that you're going to win, but you got to know which ones they are, right? So there are sales tasks that only sales can do, and we need them to go do that. But we got to get budget out. We got to do it by spending less. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we're going to systematically go after the dumb uses of sales time. You know, that list I just showed you, right? If you seriously think about a seller's activity at your company during the course of a week, let's call it 50 hours, what percentage of those 50 hours are they really engaged in those activities versus all the other stuff, right? All the other stuff. We got to go after that other stuff. We have to refocus that time savings in two ways. We've got to get them doing what they do, which is high value, and we got to extract some of the budget that we were using to fund the inefficient activities, and we got to redirect it to customer success at scale. Right? And while we're doing all this, we're doing the long-term stuff. That's what we got to do. And what is the stuff we have to go after? We have to go after the waste of time. We have to go after the, the unproductive time chasing revenue that is either not going to occur or is going to occur anyways. And I'm talking specifically about renewals, right? We're going to be talking a lot about renewals today. But what if we could cut all of this non-productive time by 50%. Think about that. What if we could cut all that non-productive sales time by 50%? If we had a goal, if we took on a goal of using data and analytics to put the right sellers in the right position to win, and putting the right deals on the table that will succeed in a perpetual contractual model, if we could do that with a high degree of precision, we could increase the win rates. We could speed up sales cycles. We could put more good opportunities in the pipeline. We would do less discounting because we're selling the right size solution, not trying to necessarily take every dollar off the table, we could increase customer adoption. We could get better business outcomes for our customers because we have great alignment between what they're able to do, what they want to do, and the stuff we sold them. Accounts would grow faster, and we would have a greater share of the wallet. I want you to read this. You can just read the orange boxes, okay? The right seller with the right information, talking to the right buyer about the right offer at a qualified and willing account on the outcomes that matter most to that customer ahead of the competition with a solution that will reliably be successful and is the right size for the customer and is where the customer is motivated and we are motivated to set the conditions for success across the life cycle during pre-sales. Doing all that at the lowest cost of sales on both existing customers and prospects. How many of you would say your company's doing all those things? Zero. You know what? You could be doing all those things. You could be doing all of those things today. But we're not. We're not. We have a very inefficient sales model, a brute force, labor-intensive sales model. 
It's not their fault, right? They're great people. They're being told what to do, and they're doing what we're asking them to do. We're just not helping them very much. We got to help them more. Now, let me talk about two, two stories to sort of set the, the background for this. <clears throat> Do you remember marketing before the digital age, right? M marketing, if you, if you, even to this day, if you think about what marketing does, they take money and they place bets, right? Think about a local business in your community, right? They have a, a marketing budget. And maybe they want to get a billboard for their hardware store or whatever it is, right? So they would say, geez, where should I put this billboard? There's all kind of billboards all over town. Where's the best billboard for me? And they would say, okay, that's going to cost this much, and I'm going to place a bet that that's going to be a good investment for me. Marketing is about taking money and placing bets. And before the digital age, they really couldn't track whether those were smart bets or bad bets. Now, now a well-run marketing organization has data feedback coming from whether it's you know uh, promotions, uh, electronic promotions on LinkedIn or or you know uh, Google Ads or whatever. They are flooded with data about the effectiveness and the efficiencies of these bets, and they're able to place smarter bets. Smarter and smarter and smarter bets. Marketing is going, has gone from one of the most data-deprived organizations in our companies to one of the most data-rich organizations in our company. And they're better at placing bets, okay? We, if we think about Salary of a sales rep. The salary of a sales rep. That is the company placing a bet, saying, I'm going to take dollars. I can put the dollars anywhere. I can put them in marketing, I put them in customer success, put them anywhere. I'm going to put them in sales salaries and commissions. And I'm going to place a bet there that I'm going to get a positive return. But it's really not a very data rich world. Right? We don't really know that much about you know, the sales inefficiencies. We can't solve the sales inefficiencies. We can't really reliably predict you know, which salesperson is going to do what and you know, which customer is going to do what and all these things. It's sort of like marketing was 15 years ago. But marketing used data to get smarter about placing bets. We need to use data to get smarter about placing sales bets, meaning the people, placing the people in sales and their salaries and their commissions in the right places. The second story I want to tell you is um, I lost a lot of money once investing in a medical device startup, okay? But the good news was I got to watch a clinical trial. Harvard ran this clinical trial. And you, I was blown away by the rigor that went into that trial. How they modeled, you know, the people that were going to participate in the trial by demographic and by, you know, age, whatever it is, and, and the hospitals that were going to be involved. I couldn't believe how much millions and millions and millions of dollars to just get through the clinical trial. Why is it so rigorous? Because the FDA wants to be able to accurately project the impact to the broader population of patients once the, the medical device was approved. By the way, it didn't get approved. They cared deeply about using a small sample to be able to accurately predict a bigger sample, a general population, okay? So two stories, digital marketing, 
making marketing much, effective, much more effective at placing bets, and taking clinical trials that allow you to take a small population and project, project onto a larger population. What if we got really good, really good, at studying our current customers? And then we took the lessons, the insights, from really, really studying those current customers, and we began to apply them to new prospects to better target and improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of our salespeople, to improve the quality of our deals, make customers more successful, repeat the process of studying the existing customers, and run the play. If we could run that play very successfully, we could reduce sales costs, we could reduce customer success costs because we're selling the right thing to the right customer, and we have set the conditions for success properly in the pre-sales process, which is going to increase and accelerate the growth of that account. And we're going to do it at less total sales cost. Okay? And I would submit to you that you, your companies, have most of the data to be able to do that right now. Not all of it, which we're going to talk about, but most of it, right? So let me ask you um, to do a little more reading. How much of this data does your company document about every customer? If I went and looked in your systems and I said, I want to see what was happening in this co company's industry at, that, at the time. What was happening to their business when they bought from us? We obviously know how much they spent. We know what products. We might know who we were competing with. We might know what partners were involved in the deal. We certainly know what components of the solution they implemented first, second, and third. We know what training they bought. We know what services they bought. We, knew what, we know what the customer's health score was at the end of 90 days and 180 days and 365 days. We know when we got our first upsell. We know who renewed and who attrited. We know all these things. Not all of them, most of them. We know most of these things. But where are these answers? If we knew all these answers, we could begin to develop models to target salespeople in infinitely better ways than we are today. So most of the data you got, here's the problem. Where is that data? Some of it's over here, and some of it's over there, and some of it's over here, and some of it's over there, right? Who's going after this? Who's pulling all this data together to try to get the insights that we can use to place not only sales resources, but support resources and service resources and customer success resources and training resources and to intelligently place bets in the form of our company's spending in the places at the right time to get the right result, not brute force. You know, even, and, and I, you know, TSIA, we've always gone, we've always eaten our dog food. Whatever we've written in our books, we have done at our business, right? When we said, it used to be sales at TSIA did the land, the expand, and the renew. Right? And then we wrote a book and we said, hey, if you do customer success correct, well, the renewal should just happen. Right? Why would we pay the seller to go back and get a renewal that the data already says, predicts very accurately that this customer is definitely going to renew? So what did we do? We ripped renewals out of the sales organization. We put all the renewals except our very top accounts 
over in the member success team, the people that you work with every day to get value from TSIA. And if they do their job right, and our systems and tools and researchers do their job right, you will renew. And we believed in that enough to rip renewals away from sales. And then, and then we left those top tier members in a major accounts sales organization that did it at all, and starting three years ago, we dismantled it. We dismantled it. We took our biggest renewals, most complex, multi-million dollar renewals, we gave them to CSMs, right? So we eat our own dog food, and we're gonna eat our own dog food on this, right? We are gonna start placing, with data and analytics, doing a better job of placing our resources and we're gonna learn how to do it along the way. And we are gonna go on a long-term journey about this. So I'm gonna again ask you to read something. I was in a conversation yesterday with a senior vice president from a very well-known SaaS company. And we were talking kind of broadly about, about this issue. And we were talking about sort of the state of the art of pricing models in SaaS, okay? The bleeding edge of pricing models in SaaS. Do you know what? those bleeding edge pricing models look like? So land, adopt, expand, renew, right? There is no renewal because they're not committed subscriptions. If customers consume, customers pay. If customers don't consume, there's no commitment. That's the leading edge. But there's one more part to the leading edge. There's no land. There's no land. There's no upfront commitment. All there is is A and E. The adoption is the expansion. There is no land. There is no renewal. If the customer uses, the customer pays. If the customer doesn't use, the customer doesn't pay. Think about that. Think about a world where all the revenue that you get out of a customer is only dependent. 100% dependent on whether they adopt and get value. And the more value they get, the more they adopt, the more they pay. And if they don't, they turn it off and walk away. We're heading, this industry is heading more and more toward an alignment of what customers pay is based on what they consume and the value they get. We're definitely heading that way, right? And in that world, in that world, what is going to matter? What's going to matter is that the conditions for success were set in the early stages of the life cycle. And then we know we have a life, we have a life cycle capability to drive adoption and expansion. We have customer success at scale. We have marketing. We have all these things. What the sellers need to do is not sign the biggest order they can. That's not what's going to matter. What matters is that they're going to properly set the conditions for success with that customer so that we can move them through the life cycle very quickly and with a high degree of success. Now, that is a very different world, very different world from the world that we all grew up in, the world of sales that built our companies, right? The activities of sales the priorities of sales, the incentives of sales, it's a very different world. But it's becoming truer and truer every day. So what we really need to do is we got to take land, adopt, expand, renew, and we have to start thinking about how to make it much, much, much more efficient. We got to get data out of those systems. We got to analyze the bloody heck out of it. We have to be able to do, develop propensity to buy models, propensity to expand models. We've already got, most of you, propensity to renew models, right? So we understand the principle. We, have, we can 
reliably predict who is an at-risk renewal and who can't, we have to get propensity to do everything. Propensity to have a failure, propensity to have a, 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 a feature that's not adopted, a propensity model to do everything, and then we have to place the right resources starting in pre-sales all the way through the entire relationship in a much more, a much smarter and more efficient way. The biggest problem, one of the remaining problems, is that there is missing data. There is missing data. We need to collect more data about the client company, more data about the client industry, and more data about what happened in the sales cycle. About, we mentioned this in the book, about three years ago, four years ago, pre-COVID, I was speaking, there were thousands of people in the room, and I asked a question. I said, how many of you, if I opened an opportunity, a closed one opportunity, and I looked at what was in there, would I find out, documented by sales, what the key business outcome priorities of the customers are? You know how many people put their hands up? Five. Thousands of people. And I said, are, you, are your sales people, are they documenting the business outcome priorities of the customer? And about 2% were doing it. And I said, that's nuts. That is absolutely nuts. We need to know what motivated them to buy. Are there changes in the healthcare industry, changes in you know, compliance or regulation or changes in the hospitality industry? What was happening in the industry that drove people to buy your solution? What business outcomes? were important to them, what goals have been set, what time frames have been established. And if we had that data for all of our customers, we could say, hey, let's study the heck out of the deals we won in healthcare. What did we sell them? What was going on in the industry? What business outcomes did they want? Who did, what buyer personas did we talk to? You know, study the heck out of that. If we did that data analysis, we could get propensity to buy models that would allow us to go to the healthcare market and use third party data to look at all the prospects, not the people that are already customers, although they may be in this too, but the whole TAM, the TAM in that industry, and say who is most likely to be ready to buy our solution, this particular solution, and why and when and then we could say to sales, go take this offer to this company and talk to this buyer about these outcomes, right? We can do this. We can do this. But we got to get that data. We have to start discovering what is outcomes are driving the customers to make the purchases they're making and we've got to document it. Because if we, if we document it, then we can figure out what to propose to get the right solution to deliver those outcomes. We have alignment between the expectations of the customer and what our customer success teams are ready to go do, and we're going to have a successful outcome. And that customer is going to want the next outcome, and the next outcome and the next outcome, and we build this machinery over and over and over again because we're collecting the missing data. We're collecting the missing, missing data. You know, how many of you have sat in a customer onboarding session where the customer is like, I can't believe you guys are asking me these questions now? Right? Like, hold on. I went through this whole protracted sales process, I just spent all this money, and now you're asking me what my priority business outcomes and what I have to get done in Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4? Whoa, where is that, right? We gotta get better. We gotta get the extra data. We've got to develop the capability 
to place resources in a, across the life cycle in a far more intensive way. And you can do that today if you develop this muscle, if you develop this capability. And, and we're going to be able to start redirecting money from sales spending. You have two choices. You can either ramp up quotas because you've made salespeople far more efficient and effective. OK, that's great. That's another way of generating budget. Or you can say, hey, we can maintain our consistent growth rates that we've been maintaining, but we can do it with less money in sales labor because we're making them far more efficient. And then we can take that money and we can start to fund our life cycle capability. More money into marketing, more money into customer success, more money into product management, more money in the places that you know you need to be putting more money into over the course of the next few years, right? We got to go do this. And there's already data out there that supports this notion of moving more of the revenue responsibility off of sales. Did you know that when customer success organizations take responsibility for upsells, overall recurring revenue grows nine points over companies that leave that job up to the sales execs? Did you know that there is no statistical difference that we can see out there between the, the renewal rates when sales does the renewals versus customer success does the renewals. But there is a big difference between what we pay the sales rep for the renewal and what we pay the CSM for the renewal. Did you know that when sales gets full quota and comp credit for renewals, subscription growth rates go down? Because they're spending time on a renewal that was already going to happen. And they're not spending as much time off finding the next new opportunity that could add net new recurring revenue to the business. Do you know that companies who deploy auto renewal terms and capabilities can increase their renewal rates by over 10%? We are proving in this industry that we can do things to generate revenue that are not the responsibility of sales. And we got to trust that. We have got to get customer success at scale. This is the most important financial challenge your companies face in the short term as you move to recurring revenue, as you move to pay per consumption pricing models. And how are we going to do that? First, we're going to monetize customer success. We're going to have premium offers. We're getting more and more of you are successfully getting your own revenue for the, your customer success function that they can then control and decide where to invest. More of you are making these hard decisions about ripping some of the revenue responsibility out of sales and moving it into customer success and creating what we call the sales dividend which is now I can take those, that time, that investment in sales, and I can redeploy it either into my pocket to fund customer success or into higher value sales activities and increase quotas. And again, the data goes on and on and on. We're looking at the cost to generate leads across leads that come from customer success versus marketing versus inbound marketing versus sales and outbound marketing. Customer success generates leads at a far less expensive rate than either marketing or sales. The percentage of, of your customer success organizations that are now spending time on upsells and lead generation is growing every single year. We're proving it can be done. We are actively actively collecting more data and using more systems in the customer success motion, which is what we should be doing. And we are proving that in that process, we can continue to drive more and more and more efficiency. Right? When was the last time you thought of the word sales and efficiency in the same sentence? Right? 
Again, not sales fault. We're not helping them enough. We're not helping them nearly as much as we could be helping them. If we did, we'd get the sales dividend. We'd be able to fund customer success. We'd be able to increase quotas. We'd be able to do the right things. We've got to go to a model like this. We've got to go to a model where we have our high expensive capability sales resources working on high complexity, high value transactions. And then we have other revenue generating muscles in our business to be able to take revenue down more cost effectively across the life cycle. So there's long-term activities. We gotta go do those. We gotta simplify the product. We gotta simplify the business. We have to digitize the customer experience. We have to do those five and 10 year things. We also need to do things now. We have got to go get the missing data. We have to change the pre-sales process. We have to get data from the seller into our systems. You know, I told a sales VP, I said, what if I told you what if I told you that every closed one opportunity, the account executive should spend two days putting data into a system? You can imagine the reaction, right? But what if that happened? What if we did better customer discovery? What if we took everything that happened in that opportunity and we put it into our systems and then we analyzed the success rate of that account, right? And we started to be able to see these trends. Hey, in healthcare, this is changing in healthcare. These, these kinds of hospital chains you know, are spending money with us and these solutions to get these business outcomes and we're selling to the chief clinical officer and we're doing all these things. And then we go use third party data to figure out who the next prospect is that we should go talk to. This can be done. We gotta do it. We gotta do it. We, TCAC cannot go through the roof. We gotta go after the sales budget. We gotta make them more effective. Key question, can sales change? You know, um, services, let's, let's take support. Services like support have lived through outsourcing. Anybody remember that, right? Remember trying to call and, and get somebody to talk to about your PC in about 1994? Right? It was really bad, right? But we, we outsourced because it was less expensive. And so we had all these onshore support facilities, and then all of a sudden we didn't. And, and support had to learn how to transform, not just cut costs, but how to actually get good at it. How to get good at it. Then support went through the period of self-service where they had to figure out how to create digital customer experiences that either prevented a case from ever happening in the first place, or if there was a case, there was a need, it was handled very efficiently. Services have had to learn to transform, and they have built muscles to help them transform and get more efficient and monitor and optimize and all those things. When is the last time sales transformed? Again, it's not that they can't. They just don't have the organizational muscle to do it. And often when, they, when somebody says, when the CEO says, we have to make a change, they don't align the compensation with the stated goals, right? Plus, if you go say to a sales manager in your company, I wanna take your number up by 50%, what's the first thing they say? I need more people. More people equals more sales. Less people, less sales, right? That's the mentality. And sales has the power to resist change, right? If somebody says, man, go change, you go, hey, if I do all this right now, this quarter, oh, it's just not a good time. Okay, okay. Well, next quarter we'll get started. You know, and that's not a good time either because we're getting near the end of the year and I'm a little worried about the pipeline, right? 
Now is not a good time. Next quarter is not a good time. Next year is not a good time. They have the power to resist. They have the power to stay because they hold the purse strings, right? They hold the top line. So how are we going to get this to change? Have you heard of this new job title, right? Chief Revenue Officer. Chief Revenue Officer. Chief Revenue Officer, if it's done correctly, is not the boss of the salespeople. It's not the head of sales, right? It's somebody who is thinking about the topics that I'm putting on the table today, who is thinking about cross-functional revenue orchestration, customer lifecycle optimization, the efficiency of revenue generation. What does it cost us to generate a dollar of revenue? And what's the best channel to generate that dollar of revenue? What data and analytics can we do to place resources in the right place at the right time across the life cycle? And what outcomes can we promise to that industry over there that we can reliably generate and maybe eventually someday price based on those outcomes. None of these are about managing salespeople. Some of the CROs that we've met two years ago were the senior vice president of sales. And now they're the CRO. And you know what they're doing? The exact same things they did when they were the senior vice president of sales. Right? This is not a snazzy title for the head of sales. This is a new and more advanced and more, I would say, targeted executive and a team that is focused on those five circles. And many of you, I would submit, don't have anybody focused on those five circles. Right? That's got to change. We have got to engineer a third option in our future which is to re-engineer customer engagement from pre-sales across adopt, expand, renew, and get much more efficient, much more effective, and be able to achieve both high growth because we're delivering the customer experience that works, and high profit because we're doing it efficiently. We have got two chapters in this book that are designed to help you and the organization begin the journey, not three years from now, not five years from now, not seven years from now, now, now. You could make huge progress in four months if you started on the journey, if you had people dedicated to this. And I swear to God, I don't think you need a million people. I think if you had five people working on this, five people working on this. You could make a meaningful difference in six months. But we gotta go, we gotta do it. And you know what else is six months from now about? <laughs> so, leave right now, run home, convince the boss well, we gotta go do this, hire the five people, go do it, get results, and I'll see you in Vegas. Thank you very much.